Hi Church, what a joy and a privilege to greet you through this video. Today we have an amazing guest speaker, Reverend Edmund Chan, all the way from Singapore. I'm deeply thankful to the Lord for Pastor Edmund, for his life and his ministry. You know that my life has been personally impacted by Pastor Edmund. When he came into our lives, when God gave me a divine appointment with him and he came into our lives, our lives actually changed and transformed for the glory of God. Because I saw in him a man who's after God, pursuing God wholeheartedly. Not only that, he has left a legacy of disciple making in his own church. I love him dearly, and I'm thankful to the Lord for the privilege that I can call him my mentor and my spiritual father and friend. So this morning, I know that you're going to be greatly blessed by the word. So put your hands together and prepare your hearts. Let's welcome Pastor Edmund. Hi, everyone. Let me begin with a story of two sworn enemies, a Japanese and an American, and the setting was in World War II. Mitsuo Fujita was the commanding pilot in charge of one of the most successful area attacks in history. Under his command was a squadron of 860 specially selected pilots. And on December 7, 1941, Fujita's squadron bombed Pearl Harbor. Fujita became one of the most highly decorated pilots in the Japanese Air Force and the one most hated by the American forces. And that included Jacob DeSelsha, a young bomber pilot who angrily swore Japan will pay for this. One day, that opportunity arose. Jacob was selected to be a part of the first bombing raids over Japan. But after dropping his bombs on the city of Nagoya, Jacob's plane crashed in enemy territory. He was taken prisoner and for almost two years, Jacob was a prisoner of war. He suffered from hunger, cold, dysentery, and he watched three of his fellow prisoners die by the firing squad. And the more he experienced this severe treatment, the deeper his hatred of the Japanese grew. Then in 1944, someone passed to Jacob a Bible. He started at Genesis and read on and on. There were some things he couldn't understand, but what he did understand brought him comfort and a growing enlightenment. And by the time he had come to the book of Romans, he had surrendered his heart and his life to Jesus as his Lord and Saviour. Immediately, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 became a crucial challenge to him. Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Despite his inner struggle, Jacob chose to obey the Lord's command. Because of it, his attitude towards his Japanese guards began to change. His hostility evaporated as he prayed for them and sought to witness to them. And every morning, he greeted them warmly. Slowly, their attitude towards him also changed. And a few of them even began to bring him extra food and supplies. Finally, the war was over and Jacob was free. Returning home, he studied for the ministry at Asbury Theological Seminary. Upon graduation, Jacob decided to return to Japan, not as a tourist, but as a missionary. He went back to Nagoya, the very city he had bombed, and he wrote a pamphlet titled, I Was a Prisoner of the Japanese. It wasn't long until a crowd of Japanese came to hear the man who could forgive and love his enemies. And for the many who came, they witnessed a life transformed by the power of the gospel. Christianity is all about the power of the gospel to transform our lives. And how do we know that this transformation is real? What's the basis of this inner transformation? What does it really look like? The essence of the answer can be found in our text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 to 5. I've titled my message, The Anatomy of Spiritual Transformation. 
What spiritual transformation looks like and the basis of it is rooted in three essentials as seen in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 to 5. Number one, an alignment that directs us. Two, an adoption that redeems us. And three, an anointing that empowers us. Let's pray as we begin our time in the Word together. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Word that instructs us and inspires us and help us to be tutored by the sacred scriptures. What it means to live a transformed life and the means necessary to see this as a living reality within our inner lives, our inner souls. Help us in this journey. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in this letter, Paul begins with a customary greetings in verse 1. Paul, Savannah, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Notice three names are mentioned here. Paul, we know, the celebrated apostle. And Timothy, we know, his famous disciple. But, but wait, who is Savannah? Well, Savannah was his Roman name. We might know him better by his other name, Silas, which is more frequent in the book of Acts. Paul and Silas went on Paul's second missionary journey. Barnabas took Mark and Paul took Silas. Paul and Silas were in prison. Paul and Silas preached the gospel. The Apostle Peter called Silas a faithful brother in 1 Peter chapter 5. Now, let me make a brief point here before we move on. The church is full of unsung heroes, people of exceptional faith, extraordinary service, and exemplary faithfulness. People whose names are not among the celebrities, and yet they stand side by side with the Pauls and the Timothys, for yes, they are the Savannas. They are ones we go, huh, who? And yet they are the ones, if you know them, you will call them faithful. So how do we grow in this kind of faithfulness? That's what First Thessalonians is all about. In this fantastic letter, this epistle, Paul began with a fascinating introduction that reveals three essentials for spiritual transformation unto faithfulness and fruitfulness. The first essential is an alignment that directs us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Verse 3. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labour of love, and the steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? The three virtues, your work of faith, your labour of love, and your steadfastness of hope. Faith, love, and hope. That's Paul's famous virtue trilogy. But don't miss the emphasis here. Because the focus is not just on the three virtues alone, but also, more importantly, on what these virtues produce in the Christian life. Therefore, note Paul's highlights. Their faith produce work. Their love produce labour. And their hope produce patience. Faith, love and hope. Faithful work, arduous labour, steadfast perseverance. All these are the products of the three virtues. But notice, they come from one important thing. Paul says that he prays noting their work of faith, their labour of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the alignment, an alignment to Jesus in our Lord Jesus Christ. And this alignment to Jesus involves action. It is not just belief but behaviour. It involves definite decisive choices that we make. 
You see, we talk a lot about divine appointments, that the God has special times and kairos moments He leads us to, divine appointments. And we also have talked about divine assignments, that God has specific assignments for specific individuals at specific times. But this understanding of divine appointment and divine assignment must be anchored in divine alignment. It is an alignment to God in Christ because this alignment is everything. It's submission to God's leading, His direction, God's will. C.S. Lewis insightfully said, there are two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, all right then, have it your way. One day I was talking to a younger leader in the business world. We were talking about purpose in life. So in that conversation, he said to me, I want to find purpose in life. I seek a purpose for my life. And I softly responded, purpose is not something you seek. Purpose is something you see. Purpose is not something you seek. Purpose is something you see. And you cannot see it unless and until your life is aligned unto God. If your life is not aligned unto God, you can seek for purpose, you will not find it. Alignment begins with evaluating in our lives what is God saying, what is God revealing, and what's important to us in our lives. Alignment begins with that receptivity and that response. It is responding to God's invitation to life. It is the Matthew 6.33 principle, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. So the first essential of a transformed life is to be aligned to God in Christ so that His will becomes our prevailing purpose. We are aligned, we are directed We don't just live as it were the driven life or just drifting around or even the design life which is important. But first and foremost, we choose to live the directed life. Is your life directed by God? Is your life congruent to the teachings of God? Congruent to the wisdom of God? Anchored in the foundation of the Word of God? Because there's no true alignment until we align to the very truth, the very foundation, the very fabric of reality that is shown in the living word of the living God. Our lives must be aligned. That's the first essential. The second essential for spiritual transformation is an adoption that redeems us. In verse 4, Paul began by saying, For we know, brothers. And and this knowing, this knowledge is exceedingly important. Psalms 100 verse 1 to 3 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Verse 3, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who hath made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Notice what it says. It says we are to worship God by what? Knowing that He is God. Knowing that it is He who has made us. Our worship is contingent to our knowledge of God. And that is why in the midst of all the circumstances in life, we can continue with that worshipful spirit because we know that God is God. We know it is the Lord who has made us and He is in control. The same idea comes in the New Testament in James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. Verse 2 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Verse 3, For you know, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. For you know. Know that the Lord, He is God. That is why we must grow in the knowledge of God. That is why we must grow in the knowledge of His Word. Because it's not just about knowledge, people. It's about perspective. It is about the ability to see. That is why in life and ministry and in leadership in particular, the ability to see is absolutely crucial. Now, in this case, we ask the question, see what? We know what. 
And verse 4 says, we know we are beloved of God. In other words, we are loved by God. Beloved of God. William Barclay, the noted New Testament scholar, says, the phrase beloved by God was a phrase which the Jews applied only to supremely great men like Moses and Solomon and to the nation of Israel itself. Now, the greatest privilege of the greatest men of God's chosen people had been now extended to the humblest of the Gentiles. And see that we are not just beloved of God. Verse 4 says, we are chosen by God. Verse 4, for we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you. Here's the question. Chosen for what? Chosen for what? It is not chosen for a job or chosen for an assignment or chosen for a mission, but chosen for an adoption, chosen for an intimate relationship with God. That is why Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5 says, For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will. He predestined us to be adopted. Now, many of you know I've adopted two daughters. They knew they were adopted since young. And I want to teach them that it's wonderful to be adopted. I don't want them to go through life, Amanda and Belicia, feeling, oh, we are second-class citizens. Oh, we are unwanted. We, nobody wants us, so we are adopted. And so while they are very young, we already told them, you are adopted. And this is how we tell them. Because we don't want them to be uh, perhaps in the playground in the Sunday school with some children and, and as adult conversation goes, somehow it leaks to the children and then the children say to my daughter, oh, you are adopted, you know. This kind of thing's hard to keep in, under wraps. I would rather for my own kids tell them right from the beginning. So if you ask my daughters, when did you know you were adopted? Their answer will be, oh, since very young. And this is how we did it. Once a week, we take them to a family picnic. It usually happens after the Sunday sermon, about 4.30 in the afternoon, we will take them to East Coast and, and have a family time together. And just before dinner time, we will gather the kids and I'll carry the two little girls. I'll walk by the side of the beach and I'll say to them, say bye-bye sky and they repeat bye-bye sky and bye-bye clouds, bye-bye sea, bye-bye sand, bye-bye birds, and then we will say finally, bye-bye God, thank you for adopting us. And I turn to these two little girls and say to them, adopted means love. So since young, they, they were given this understanding, this truth, adopted means loved. And then I tell them, God has adopted us in the same way mommy and daddy have adopted you. Adopted means love loved. They grew up with that understanding. Some years ago, my daughter was on national television. Uh, we have adopted a dog and so that program was on the adoption of dogs. And Belicia said on national TV, oh my dog, I have adopted her in the same way I am adopted because in my family, adopted means loved. You see, when we come to the theology of adoption, that's what we must grasp. Beloved of God, chosen of God, chosen for a relationship of intimacy and adoption. God adopted us and adopted means love. He adopted us in Christ Jesus. You see, when God created us, He loved us. And He created us in purity, in love to enjoy His blessings. It's not a story of a lonely God and He has no one to relate to, so He created us so that we can keep Him company. No, God is full and fulfilled in Himself eternally. He created us not to get something from us. He creates us to give something of Himself to us. 
So He created us in that love. But Genesis chapter 3 tells us that we have sinned against God and we have fallen in that sin and that relationship was broken. But God loved us so much that He sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins so that once again, we can come into the adoption of God in Christ Jesus. Because on the cross, God forgave our sins. To everyone who believe in Him, the Bible says, believe in Jesus, you shall be saved. Coming back to Matthew 6.33 is a misunderstood verse very often. We, we read in that verse, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Why His righteousness? We know what it means to seek God's kingdom, His cause, His calling, His kingdom. But why add the phrase His righteousness? So very often we think, oh, seek first the kingdom of God and His standard, His righteousness, His requirement. That's not what the verse means. Rather, what the verse means is this, seek first the kingdom of God and His gift of righteousness in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus Himself said in Matthew chapter 5, at the end of it, that unless your righteousness surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And, and the whole chapter explains what it means to stand in righteousness before God. And we cannot pass that test. The, the whole of chapter 5 explains, as it were, how we fall short of God's righteousness. And then we understand God gave us His righteousness in Christ Jesus. So seek first the kingdom of God and His gift of righteousness in Christ. That's what it's about. And here comes the best part. There is a gift of God that is greater than justification, the forgiveness of sins. Now, what can be a greater gift than justification? The answer, the gift of adoption. It is an amazing gift. Because imagine if God says to us, okay, I have saved you, and by faith you believe in Jesus, I forgive you. Now get out of my sight, I don't want ever to see you again. That would be a terrifying thing. But no, He didn't say that. He says, I have saved you in Christ Jesus. Believe in the Lord Jesus. I forgive you of your sins. Welcome home. And He extends to us this gift of an adoption because adopted means loved. That's why J. Packer says this, adoption is the highest privilege that the gospel offers. Higher even than justification. This free gift of acquittal and peace, won for us at the cross at the cost of Calvary, is wonderful enough in all conscience, but justification does not of itself imply any intimate or deep relationship with God the judge. In idea, at any rate, you could have the reality of justification without any close fellowship with God resulting. But contrast this now with adoption. Adoption is a family idea, conceived in terms of love and viewing God as Father. In adoption, God takes us into His family and fellowship and establishes us as His children and heirs. No wonder the scripture says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the sons of God. 1 John 3, 1. And how do we become sons and daughters of God? Only one way. John 1, 12. Yet to all who receive Him, to those who believe in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Adopted. And adopted means love. So we are beloved of God. We are chosen of God. That's the second essential for a transformed life. Here's the third essential. An anointing that empowers us. There is an alignment to God in Christ. There is an adoption that redeems us. And now there is an anointing that empowers us. Look at verse 5. The first part of verse 5 
It says, because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Did you get that? Not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. E. Stanley Jones, missionary to India, says, Pentecost is not a spiritual luxury. It is an utter necessity for human living. The human spirit fails unless the Holy Spirit fails. It is Pentecost of failure. Now, I read in one Christian uh, article, it says, the Holy Spirit did not fall on Paul's ministry by a wonderful luck. The power of Paul's preaching to the Thessalonians depended on the kind of man Paul was among the Thessalonians. Well, that's yes and no. It's a bit too anthropocentric for me. Let me explain. We think if a leader has a great ministry, it must be the work of the Spirit. That's true. Observation correct. Conclusion wrong. Because now we are concluding, it must be the work of the Spirit through the leader. Therefore, it means that this is a great Christian and these are great leaders. There's a great confusion in the celebrity culture, especially in the modern church. There are two extremes here. Either we get so caught in the celebrity syndrome, we put leaders on a pedestal and we hero worship them, or we presumptuously use the term celebrity syndrome and we fail to give honour where honour is due because of our own insecurity or pride or both. But herein lies the greatest confusion of all. We are confused as to what the spirit-filled life is all about. We don't realise that very often the, the success in ministry is, is a gift and calling, but it does not necessarily indicate the Spirit-filled life. Now, let me say something provocative, but I believe true. A leader can have a phenomenally successful ministry, but live in a private, a carnal life. You see, the Spirit-filled life is misunderstood in at least five ways. Number one, it's misunderstood as optional. But the term, be filled with the Spirit, is stated as a command. The verb, be filled, is an imperative verb. A, an imperative verb is a command, not an optional suggestion. So it's better understood, you must be filled with the Spirit, a command, not a suggestion, not optional. Number two, it's misunderstood as just a one-time event. But, but the phrase, be filled with the Spirit, is used in the continuous tense. Translated, you must be filled with the Spirit continually, not once and for all. Third misconception, it is misunderstood with a flawed imagery. Very often, the feeling imagery is like an empty patrol uh, tank kind of imagery. So your car is empty or patrol, you go to the filling station, take out the cap, you top it up and it's now full. So we think like, well, it's something like that. I, I'm a bit empty of the Holy Spirit. I come and screw off the cap and ask the Spirit to fill me. And now it's filled to the top. I'm full of the Spirit. It is a weak and, and painful imagery. It is, it's not like that. Because the filling of the Spirit is not how much I have of the Spirit. It's the reverse. It's how much the Holy Spirit has of me in surrender, in sanctification. The next is we misunderstood the baptism of the Spirit. Now, this is stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 13. For by one Spirit, we're all baptized into one body. Now, this baptism of the Spirit is once and for all at the point of conversion, but the filling of the Spirit is not once and for all. The baptism of the Spirit ushers in the indwelling of the Spirit, and with it is the gifts of the Spirit. And, and this, this uh, baptism of the Spirit that brings about sal uh, the, the salvation, the, the Christian life, is for all Christians. So all Christians have the baptism of the Spirit by which we are now identified as one body in Christ. All Christians have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit by which we are joined in, unto God in Christ. 
All Christians have the gift of the Spirit. Paul says God gives different gifts to different ones as He wills. But the Spirit-filled life is not necessarily true for all Christians. Indwelling, yes. Baptism of the Spirit that uh, brings about the inaugural part of the indwelling, yes. Gifts of the Spirit, yes, for all Christians. But the filling of the Spirit? It is the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit where we surrender ourselves to Him. It is more than just tongues of the anointing. The Spirit-filled life is about a surrender. It's about a sanctification of life. It's about being strengthened in Him. And it's not the kind of strengthening whereby the spiritual gift, the spiritual gifted life is strengthened for ministry. The Spirit-filled life it is the anointing for life, leadership, ministry. But it's a transformational, sanctifying work. So don't get confused with the two. Listen carefully now. The spirit giftedness is not equal to spirit filled. Spirit gifted life is not a mark of spiritual maturity. The spirit filled life is. So the Spirit-filled life is not merely about our spiritual giftedness, it's about our sanctification, it's about the power of God in our lives. Think about it. We can dance in the Spirit but struggle in secret sin. Where's the power of God in our lives? We speak in tongues but gossip and criticize and condemn with the same tongue. Where's the power of God in our lives? We shout and praise God, but yet we complain and gripe. Where's the power of God in our lives? We declare God is mighty, but we are anxious and worried. Where is the power of God in our lives? Where's the anointing? Where's the Spirit-filled life? Oh, I love God. I was converted in 1968. Although I backslided for four years, God in His grace helped me and called me back. And once I came back from my backsliding, I was on fire for God. So yes, I love God. But I wasn't taught the Spirit-filled life. So even from the time where I answered God's call, I came into the ministry, went to Singapore Bible College to prepare myself for the ministry, I wasn't tutored in the Spirit-filled life. All I was concerned was the Word of God, the Word of God, which is not wrong. It's the foundation. But as I was emphasizing the Word of God, I failed to see that the Word of God speaks about the Spirit of the living God, the anointing of God, the Spirit-gifted life and the Spirit-filled life. Couldn't see that. Especially in the early days, in, in the 70s, in the 80s, uh, there was a great confusion and, and uh, fights, as it were, in different camps, the charismatics and the non-charismatics. I remember my first year in Bible college, I was debating with a fourth year student. I was like a student of John MacArthur because I read everything, memorized it, and, and I was criticizing the charismatics and the Pentecostals and the shallowness of their theology. And I won the debate because I could quote the scriptures and, and speak theologically and biblically, but inside I didn't understand the anointing. And this fourth-year student, all he said at the end of that discussion and that was, one day you will know. In my arrogance, I was thinking, come on, if you lose the debate, you cannot see it biblically and theologically. Don't talk like that. One day you will know. Just acknowledge that that is, is so shallow, you know. That was most my arrogance and I repent of it. Because one day, a man of God stepped into the Singapore Bible College chapel. I've never seen a man who spoke with such intimacy about God. A man who says, God speak to me and I don't understand because I, I know this man. I hear his preaching. His name is Tom Hamblin. I am drawn, as it were, to his, his anchor in the scriptures and, and drawn to his integrity. I hear his testimony about the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. So I asked for some time for me to speak with him. I was thinking we would spend an hour together. We spent four hours that afternoon at Bible House. 
And he regaled me with stories after stories, testimonies after testimonies of the power of God's Spirit at work. My heart was strangely warm and I came to a place after that meeting. I went over from Bible House to the Armenian church, sat in solitude and quietness and said, Lord, I, I, I don't want these gifts. And that's not what I'm seeking. If you give me, thank you, Lord, but that's not what I'm seeking. Oh, I know, oh, I'm convicted of that I never really seen before. Be filled with the Spirit is a command. So here, Lord, fill me with the Spirit. Teach me to obey. I want to follow your command. No lightning, no thunder. But since that time, in 1984, my life was open to God's Spirit. And then I found a book I want to recommend to you and this book helped me so much in my understanding of the Spirit-filled life. The title of the book is The Word and Power Church by Doug Bannister. Uh, I, I love it. I'm biased because he's an evangelical free church pastor. I, was an, I am an evangelical free church pastor. And as a young pastor in those days, he's go like, whoa, let me read this. And Doug Bannister has a Doctor of Ministry degree from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, a conservative seminary. And Jai Packer wrote in this book, uh, his testimonial of the book, he said, the convergence of theology and practice about which Bannister writes is truly healthy and hopeful. So I started reading his book, and this is the part that struck me. It says, Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of my heroes and my mentor in expository preaching, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, never preached anything halfway, and this was no exception. He thought it was foolish to believe that the gifts had ceased. Before that, I thought the gifts have ceased. I was quoting John MacArthur, yes, the gifts have ceased. But when I studied the scriptures, I came to a different conclusion. And then I recognized it's not just my conclusion. There are other competent biblical scholars who study the scriptures and come to the same conclusion, the gifts of God have not ceased. And so I wrote my ordination paper on power encounter with the main thesis that the gifts of God are non-normative but non-cessational. Not all the gifts are for everyone, but the gifts have not ceased. The Spirit of the Lord gave different gifts to whom He wills. Then he continues, Doug Bannister says, Later, I listened to a tape by John Piper, a respected evangelical leader, pastor and author. He gently went through the arguments and said that as much as he respected those who believed the gifts have ceased, he could not make that argument biblically. Next, he says, J.I. Packer's writing on the subject also assumed that these gifts could be available today. And finally, he added, the final blow to cessation for me personally came when I read D.A. Carson's commentary on 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. Dr. Carson is a leading evangelical New Testament scholar and a professor at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, my denomination seminary. He too concluded that nowhere does the scripture, does the Bible teach that God cannot give these gifts to the church today. As I hear the testimony, my heart was strangely warm. As I study the scriptures, I find my mind enlightened. As I read like this, I come to the conclusion, Lord, I know so little, I'm like a baby. I hear people speak about the voice of God. There, there are two camps. One, they, they are frivolously using it. God obviously have not spoken to them. They have made a mess where they say, God speak to me. But I hear the likes of Tom Hamblin when he say, God speak to me, there's gravitas, there's weight. There is reality. God, I want that reality. Teach me. And the rest, as they say, is history. I find a happy balance between the Word and the Spirit, and I feel that there's a biblical balance that is necessary. It has been said before, all Word and no Spirit, we dry up. All Spirit and no Word, we blow up. But we both Word and Spirit, we grow up. Did you hear that? So don't just tell, show and tell, be transformed. Let me close where we began. When Jacob de Selcher was converted and became a changed man, 
The Japanese commander, Mitsuo Fujita, on the other hand, came out a very disillusioned man after the war. Because of his wartime commission, he was often called into the city to testify at the war crime trials. On one of these trips to Tokyo, he was handed a pamphlet, the very pamphlet that Jacob had written, titled, I was a prisoner of the Japanese. Commander Fujita read it and reread it. He couldn't believe Jacob could forgive his tormentors, but he was intrigued enough to buy a Japanese Bible. And in reading the Bible, Fujita was especially affected by the words that Christ spoke on the cross when he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In his own words, Fuchida continued his testimony. Then I came to the death of this carpenter and read that he had prayed from the cross, O Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Why then, I thought to myself, Jesus had prayed for me. That night in the farmhouse, Misua Fuchida, who did not know a single Christian, asked God to forgive him and became a Christian himself. And he began to tell others about Christ. He told them how he found the answer to this despair and defeat. He told them that God has not come to lead armies, but to lead men and women out of hatred into love. And Fuchida became a faithful evangelist for Jesus in Japan and beyond. Soon after, he met Jacob. And it wasn't long until these two men, who were once sworn enemies, they became the best of friends and brothers in Christ. And one of the books Fuchida had written is titled, From Pearl Harbor to Calvary. And it's the inspiring story of Fuchida's conversion to Christianity and his call to the ministry. And central to this narrative, is the message that God transformed lives even through the most improbable of circumstances. Fuchida and Jacob, sworn enemies from diverse backgrounds of wartime hate and pride, yet Jacob and Fuchida both had their lives marvelously transformed, marvelously transformed by the power of the gospel and the love of Jesus. Do you get this? God wants to change our lives. God wants to transform us. And there are three essentials. There's an alignment to Christ. There is an adoption from God in Him. And there is this anointing of the Spirit. Christ, God, the Spirit, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity in our spiritual transformation. We need this. We need the alignment. We need the adoption. We need the anointing. You cannot have one without the other for a transformed life. If you have the alignment, the alignment, the cause of Christ, the mission of Christ, the Great Commission, but you don't have that redemptive adoption, the un you have the adoption, but you don't appreciate that love, it becomes very harsh. The task, the ministry, but not the love. You'll burn out. You'll become spiritually dry. But if you focus in worship of God, oh, the love, how wonderful, but there's no ministry, you become like a reservoir without the outlet. It will not be healthy. But if you have this, this sense of this redemptive love and, and this alignment, this adoption, and, and you are serving Christ, but you don't have the anointing, you won't have the power of the Spirit to be directed in divine appointments, divine assignments, and divine alignment. We don't have the power to change our lives until God steps in. And in His Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit, through that redemptive adoption and intimacy with Him, we are transformed. The Gospel is all about that transformed life in Christ Jesus and the intimacy of relationship in Him and the expression of a ministry through Him by the power of the Spirit of the living God. That's the anatomy of spiritual transformation the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at work in us. Would you bow with me and pray? Eternal God and Heavenly Father, 
thank you for the book of Thessalonians that we are going through and the instructions and the revelations you give to us. Today, O oh God, help us to be drawn to Christ Jesus, to be aligned to Him, so that in Him we might have the adoption of God and in the adoption, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Help us, O oh God. Some of you listening to this, have not yet received Jesus as your personal Lord and Saviour. Today, I want to give you the invitation and the opportunity to do so. How do you do it? How do you align with Jesus and, and allow Him to come to your life so that your life is transformed? You pray a simple prayer of faith. I'm going to lead you in that prayer. Just speak it in your hearts as you pray to God. It's a simple prayer. Say it with me. Dear God, I'm sorry I'm a sinner. Please forgive my sins. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Lord Jesus, I receive you now as my personal Lord and Saviour. The Bible says if you believe in God, in Christ, and you received Him by faith, He will come in to change your life. For some of you who are already Christians, but you're saying, I want to grow spiritually. How do I do that? The Apostle Paul tells us, you've got to understand an alignment. You've got to understand an adoption. You've got to understand anointing. An alignment, an adoption, an anointing. And this day, just as I had to lay down my stubborn heart, just as I had to lay down my pride, just as I can come and say, Lord, fill me with your spirit. I am a Christian. I love God. I want to advance His cause, but I'm powerless. Fill me with your spirit. May the Lord help you to be aligned to Him, to cherish and, and just be blessed by His love and be anointed by the power of His Spirit. If this is your desire, would you pray this simple prayer with me? Dear God, I do not want to walk in spiritual impotence. I want to walk in the reality of both the Word and the Spirit. Help me, O oh God, to be grounded in Your Word, to be a life in Your Spirit, to be strengthened and empowered and anointed by Your Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit. Help me, O oh God. Father, thank You for this time we share together. I pray for each one of us, myself included, that wherever we are in our spiritual journey, draw us back to the alignment, the adoption, and the anointing. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.